Vanilla and I are well into watching the 1970s BBC production of War and Peace. There are 20 episodes in it, and we've seen 13 at this. We've seen it before, but it's been years. We thought we'd watch it again, and up to, uh, so we got seven more to go. It's very well done, as I say. Anthony Hopkins is, is superb. But I can't help thinking, I mean, this is, a lot else is going on as well, but of course it's the story of the, Rus uh, the Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. An invasion which figures very widely, but maybe a million people lost their lives. And hundreds of thousands of French soldiers lost their lives. And I don't know about you, but I can't watch this and the battle scenes and so on without thinking, that could have been me. We have no choice in when and where we are born. Other people were born there. I happened to be born where I was born and when. But that could have been me just as well. And of course, this week we're thinking of the First World War, the Second World War, and the same questions apply or the same considerations apply. Those of us who are here tonight were not involved. None of us were involved. I take it, in the, even in the Second World War, but many of us know those who were. And of course, there were many, many who lost their lives. It could have been us, but it wasn't. And there's a mystery there that we can't understand, and the only thing I can conclude is that the mystery is beyond me, but my job is to be faithful where I am in my generation and so on. I can't be someone else than what I am. I just have to be faithful where I am. But it's also appropriate that we take time and reflect on those who did live then, many of whom did not survive the war. And those who did were, of course, changed for the rest of their lives by the experience. And we we live in the benefits of what they, what they did for us. For that we are thankful. Let's go on this evening with Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and I'm just going to read, it's not a long chapter, I'll just read through the chapter in its entirety. Now after the Sabbath, Matthew 28, 1, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole them away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, the story of the chapter is straightforward enough, and it's not going to be our main focus. I'll make a few comments on it to begin with. But the story itself is straightforward enough. The implications, the consequences of the resurrection, on the other hand, are enormous. And we're going to spend most of our time this evening focusing not on the story itself, but on the implications, what it means for us. What difference does it make that Jesus rose again from the dead? But first, a little bit about the story itself. We're told after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week. That Jesus rose on the first day of the week is underlined in each of these accounts. And it explains why the first day of the week is important in other parts of the New Testament. We find the disciples meeting on the first day of the week in Acts chapter 20. John talks about being in the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day, which was the first day of the week. And obviously what has happened is that the early Christians decided the first day of the week the day of Jesus' resurrection was the day on which they ought to meet together. They often met daily, we're told, in Jerusalem at the beginning, but that wasn't always possible or wasn't everywhere possible. But they did meet the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. It's interesting in John's Gospel that Jesus appears to his disciples twice, once on the first day of the week when Thomas wasn't there, and Thomas couldn't really believe that Jesus had appeared, so Jesus appears to them the next time, eight days later, which is an inclusive week, meaning it was the first day of the week next week as well. The first day of the week then, the day of Jesus' resurrection. It's interesting that there is no account in any of the Gospels of the resurrection itself. We have the story of the arrest the trial, the crucifixion, the burial of Jesus. And then what comes next is people going to the tomb and discovering that Jesus has already risen. Right? Not a single one of the Gospels tells the story of the resurrection, though they go through all the details before. But when we come to the resurrection, it's already happened, and we have people gradually coming to realize that it has happened. Sometimes it happens more quickly than other times. But what's very clear is that absolutely nobody was expecting it. These women go to the tomb. <laughs> I say nobody was expecting it. The strange thing is his enemies seem to have had a better grip on this than his disciples because his enemies want to set a guard for the tomb because he said he might ri he'd rise again on the third day and they want to see to it that that's not going to happen. They have, they've got that under control. They realize that. The disciples don't seem to be expecting it. And the women on the third day go to see the tomb, explicitly we're told. Not to check if it's open, not to see if Jesus is risen as he said, just to see the tomb. Luke's Gospel tells us about two disciples who are on the way to Emmaus and who are lamenting the fact that it came, it's all come to nothing. This is on Easter Sunday. Jesus comes and is with them, and they're lamenting that it has all come to nothing. The other disciples, were told in John chapter 20, are meeting behind locked doors because they're afraid that the people who were arrested and put Jesus to death are going to be coming for them next. They're not expecting anything. Nobody seems to be expecting it. And even when they see Jesus, it's interesting that in several of the accounts, they don't recognize him. 
Now, obviously, there's something about the transformation of his resurrection body, but it's also clearly an indication that they weren't expecting this. And so even when they see him, they don't pick up on it immediately that this is indeed Jesus. Nobody was expecting it. And yet, of course, Jesus rose. An angel announces it in Matthew 28 as an angel announced the birth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, right? The angel comes to Joseph and says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. What's conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The angel announces in the beginning, the angel announces at the end. Nice kind of bookends at the beginning and the end of the gospel. The guards were told when the angel comes, tremble and are like dead men. They're terribly afraid. But the first message to the women by the angel is, the angel terrifies the soldiers, but the angel's message to the women is, you don't have to be afraid. Don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid because you've come to see Jesus. He's not here. So others are terrified. They don't need to be. And yet we're told that when they see Jesus, or they're going away from the tomb in fear and great joy, now, that might seem an implausible combination, but when you think of the circumstances, it couldn't be anything else, could it? Great joy, obviously, that Jesus has risen again, but, but this is overwhelming. This is awesome in the full sense of the word, not the uh, deteriorated sense of the word that people use it today. Absolutely awesome. Wonder dash full. And there is fear and great joy, fear in the presence of God is at work. God is doing something. God has done something incredible here at the same time as there is great joy. Jesus has risen again. And the first person to do so, not to die again. There are other resurrection stories in the Old Testament and the New. Jesus himself raised people from the dead. Dorcas is going to be raised in Acts chapter 9, the end of Acts chapter 9. Yeah, I think it's not chapter 9, the end of chapter 9. Um, Elijah and Elisha. But those, Lazarus, of course, but those people were raised from the dead back to their corruptible bodies and they died again. They had the privilege of doing it twice. Jesus rose again with a transformed body never to die again. He died once for all to sin, and now he lives to God. Romans chapter 6. When people see the risen Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, both the women and then the disciples later on, and recognize him as the risen Jesus, what they do is worship him, fall at his feet and worship him, we're told. And surely again, no other response is possible this awesome, wonderful, incredible event that has taken place has transformed the one they knew and, and lived beside for years. Now they can only worship him. And yet we're told those who will not believe still will not believe. Those who did all they could to see that he was put to death now the story is circulating that he's risen. They're not interested in inquiring about what's really happened. They're just interested in squelching the story because this will make them look very bad. Those who will not believe, will not believe. Remember what Jesus said at the uh, end, uh, it's part of his parable of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. And the rich man in Hades wants Lazarus to go and tell his brothers so that they won't come to this place. And Jesus says, they have Moses in the, they, that's Abraham who says it, isn't it? They have uh, in the parable, they have Moses and the prophets. Oh, but let Lazarus go because they'll believe him. No, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe Lazarus, even if he rises from the dead. As these people weren't prepared to investigate even a story that Jesus rose from the dead. Those who will not believe will not believe, and miracles themselves will not make the transformation. The disciples are commissioned 
because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later as one of the significant things that the resurrection means. But notice it's because all authority is given to me, therefore you are to go. Because I have all power, you are empowered to go, and it is important, it is crucial that you go. And you're to make disciples of all nations. And again, we have this perfect conclusion to the gospel. It's interesting that it ends here. It doesn't tell the story of the ascension or anything. It ends with Jesus' words. Go make disciples of all, baptizing them, teaching them all that I have commanded you. And, well, how are they supposed to know? How are they supposed to recall all that Jesus has commanded them? Or how Jesus has taught them? Or how are later disciples to know that? Well, it's the end of a gospel. And all that Jesus has taught in the gospel of Matthew, and of course the others as well, is to be passed on as his teaching to those who are going to be his disciples. And Jesus says he will be with them even to the end. Now, there is this question of the persons of the Trinity, and we're told in John's gospel that it's Jesus' spirit or the Holy Spirit who is sent to be with them, and it's through the presence of the Holy Spirit that we experience Jesus' presence today. But that Holy Spirit bringing Jesus' presence to us making Jesus' presence real to us, is with us to the end. All right, that's just briefly the story. Let me pick up on now, for a few minutes, seven implications of the story, or seven significant things that we should bear in mind because of the resurrection. First question, what makes an apostle an apostle? Well, the word is used in different senses in the New Testament. Sometimes it just means a messenger, an ordinary message. Messenger, somebody who's been delegated and given some authority to carry a message. And it doesn't need to be a messenger of Jesus. It can be a messenger of Paul or a messenger of the Philippian church or so on. It can be used in an everyday sense. But when the New Testament talks about the apostles... It's speaking about not just a messenger in the every sense, in the everyday sense, but the apostles of Jesus Christ. And even speaking of the apostles of Jesus Christ, there are different understandings of just what made an apostle. Luke in particular, but Revelation also, speak of the 12 apostles. And the criteria for being one of these 12 apostles was, of course, that they were chosen by Jesus. But you remember, Jesus chose 12, and then one departed from the scene. That was Judas. And yet, Peter still felt, we need to be 12. That's what Jesus chose. There are 12 tribes of Israel. We need 12. And so we need to pick one more to be, make up the 12th. And the criteria that were required of someone who was going to be an apostle, one of the 12 apostles, were he had to have been with Jesus from the time of the baptism of John the Baptist, with Jesus then from the beginning of his ministry to the being a witness of his resurrection. So being without, with Jesus throughout his whole ministry and a witness of his resurrection. Apparently there were a number of people who met those criteria, and among them they had to choose one, and they chose Matthias. Paul's not one of those 12 apostles, but Paul is very insistent that he is an apostle, and he's using the word in a little different sense then, and yet it is still crucial for Paul not that he had been with Jesus from the time of the baptism of John the Baptist, because Paul didn't meet that criterion, but it was still essential that if you're going to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, you had to have witnessed his resurrection. And Jesus, Paul says that he too had seen the risen Jesus. And on that basis, because he had seen the risen Jesus and been commissioned by him, he too was an apostle in this a little broader sense but nonetheless, a closed group. There are only so many people who saw the resurrected Jesus and were commissioned by him. Paul says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is what it takes. 
It's a bigger, it's a wider category than Luke's 12 apostles, but it's still essential that he had seen the resurrected Jesus. Here's the point. The church of Jesus Christ is built on the foundation of the apostles. Now, in another sense, the only foundation is Jesus Christ, of course, but also the apostles, Ephesians chapter 2, because they were the witnesses of Jesus and especially of his resurrection. And the church is built upon the testimony, the resurrection of the apostles. They believed because they had seen, but we believe not because we've seen the risen Jesus, but because we believe the testimony of those who did. And so the church is necessarily built on the foundation of the apostles and their testimony. And in this sense, I know people use the word in a, in a variety of senses, but in this sense, there cannot be an apostle today. I know people use it in other ways, but in this sense, somebody who had seen the resurrected Jesus and is therefore part of the foundation of the church, there can't be anyone meeting those criteria today. Our church is built on the foundation of those who were apostles in that sense. And for the same reason, the New Testament is a closed book because it is made up of the testimony of those who were apostles themselves or in close contact with the apostles, and we aren't that. However inspired you may feel in what you, whatever you may be writing, you're not going to be writing anything that's going to be entered into the New Testament. It's a closed book because it's built on the foundation, the testimony of those who had been with Jesus and seen his resurrection. Second implication, and I'm going to have to pick up the tempo here. The resurrection vindicated Jesus' claims. What do I mean by that? Jesus claimed that the kingdom of God was coming in his ministry. That he, in fact, was the one who was bringing the kingdom of God. That he was the son of man who was going to come on the clouds of heaven. He even spoke of himself as the son. He forgave sins. He said the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, and on and on and on we could go. The point is, all of these claims were rejected by the religious authorities of his day, and they certainly seemed to have come to nothing when Jesus was crucified. Did he say he was the Son of God? Did he say he could forgive sins? Did he say this, that, and the other thing? It was obviously all bunk. Look at he's being crucified. This is the end. But no, he was raised from the dead, and in God's raising him from the dead, God is showing his approval of Jesus and his vindication of Jesus and the truth of the claims that Jesus made. So Jesus claims all that he claimed that seemed to come to nothing because of the, res uh, because of the crucifixion were proved true by the resurrection. Thirdly, Jesus' resurrection proves that his death was a part of God's plan. Because after all, if God is raising him from the dead as part of his plan, then Jesus' death itself must have been a part of God's plan. It wasn't just that his enemies got the best of him and nailed him to a cross. No, it was part of God's plan, as Jesus had announced all along, but this proves it when he's raised from the dead. And so there must have been something significant about Jesus' death in God's plan. There must be a reason why he had to be crucified. And of course, without developing the point tonight, we know that it was to atone for our sins. And without his death and resurrection, we could not be saved. But his resurrection proves the importance of his crucifixion. His resurrection goes together with his exaltation and promotion. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In connection with his resurrection, Matthew 28, 18. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36, 
Ephesians chapter 1, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, and he put all things under his feet. Jesus' resurrection is not just his coming back to life, it is his exaltation and promotion to God's right hand, where he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Peter says he was, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And it's important that we think about the implications of calling Jesus Lord. On the one hand, the word Lord simply means master. And as there were slaves, so there were masters. You can't have a husband without having a wife, and you can't have a slave without having a master. And the word for master is this word kurios, which is, which is also Lord. So when we call Jesus our Lord, we're saying that he is our master. We're saying that we're his servants, we're his slaves. The, Paul doesn't hesitate to use that language. We're to do what he wants us to do. He is our Lord. But when we confess that Jesus is Lord, or when Peter says that God has made him Lord in Christ, he's not just saying a personal testimony, he's my Lord. He's saying God has made him Lord of heaven and earth. God has given him authority over all heaven and earth. So he is my Lord, but he is also Lord of heaven and earth. Fifthly, the resurrection marks the beginning of the new creation or of the new humanity, or of the age to come. The old humanity was marked by and marred by the sin of Adam and the consequences of that sin. Sickness, death, disease, wars, everything else characterizes the old age inaugurated by Adam's sin. The new age, and that's why Paul can refer to it as the present evil age, Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Now, in Jewish thought, they divided this present age, this present evil age, from the age to come. Things are bad now, but God is going to put things right in the age to come. The interesting variation on that that we get in the New Testament is, yes, there is this present age, evil age, and yes, there is an age to come that is coming, but it's already started. It's already here. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. There is a new creation. Galatians chapter 6 also speaks of the new creation. Um, Romans chapter 5 speaks of the old humanity in Adam and the new humanity in Christ. So what was not, I mean, the distinction between this age and the age to come was already there in Jewish thought. The Christian variation is present evil age, age to come. But now there's an overlapping period because we're still living in the present evil age. We can see that all around us. And yet the age to come has already begun with Jesus' resurrection. And the New Testament proof that it has begun is that the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Because the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, was one of the gifts of the age to come. In the age to come, God was going to pour out his Spirit on all flesh. He was going to put his Spirit in his people so that they could obey his laws, Ezekiel 36. And that has happened. So it is a mark of the age to come already having begun... And yet, how is the Holy Spirit spoken of? As the down payment of all the gifts of the age to come. It's come, and the initial gift of the age to come has already been given, even though the rest is still to come. Or the Holy Spirit is the first fruits. You have the first apples growing on the tree are a sign that there's more to come later. The, re the resurrection and the gift of the Holy Spirit are the first fruits of all the blessings that are going to come in the age to come. Sixthly, and just two more, because Jesus rose again, those who are believers in him can and must live differently. The Old Testament people of God were under the law, and the law told them what they ought to do, but it didn't empower them to do it. 
the New Testament makes very clear that the people of God in the New Testament have been given the power to live as they ought. They've been given the Holy Spirit and they are to walk in the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. They are to do what could not be done by those who are simply under the law. Another way the New Testament puts it is that people who are believers in Jesus have been baptized into Christ, and that means that they died to sin and can now live to God. So that old life under sin and under the power of sin, you've died with Christ to that. And now as Christ rose again from the dead, so you too can live in newness of life, Romans chapter 6 tells us. That is a new, qualitatively new life. The age to come is an age of righteousness, and that righteousness must already be seen in those who claim to be Christ's people. Paul sums up his personal experience. Roman chapter 6 puts it in general terms. If you're a believer in Christ, you've died with Christ to sin. You're to live a new kind of life. Paul puts it personally at the end of Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, so now I live, but it's not really I. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Seventhly and finally, the resurrection proves that neither sin nor death has the final word. Though they seem to, certainly seems by all we see that sin is triumphing in our world and that we all come to death and that's the end. Sin and death seem to have the last word, but the resurrection of Jesus is the proof that they do not. It's proof that's needed. And if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then we are of all people most miserable, Paul tells us. But it's not just us. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then there's no hope for the world either. And so sin and death prevail and have the last word in us and in the world if Christ is not risen. But Christ is risen. God is all-powerful and all-good. And even though there may be evil in his world for a time as people resist him and, and reject him and rebel against him, God must prevail in the end. God's goodness will prevail in the end. God is going to put things right. And the way he does so is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, the first sign, the first the down, down payment, the first fruits of the age to come that is already here. Sin and death will not have the final word because Christ has risen. And in his resurrection, our resurrection is guaranteed as well. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Romans 6, 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8, 11. The dead in Christ will rise, 1 Thessalonians 4. Christ has risen the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, 1 Corinthians 15. All these passages saying that Christ has risen, and because Christ has risen, those who are in Christ will rise as well. So we sorrow with the death of Jill, with death whenever it encounters us. We certainly sorrow and should sorrow, but we do not sorrow as those who have no hope because we know that Jesus is risen. We will rise too and be with him forever. So when we say that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, we're not just talking about something that happened 2,000 years ago. Because he rose, we today have a faith built on the testimony of the apostles. When he arose, God pro proved that Jesus was right, and we can believe his words. When he arose, God showed that he accepted Christ's death as the atonement for our sins. When he arose, God exalted him to be Lord of all. When he arose, the age to come began already in this present evil age, and God has given us his spirit. Because he arose, believers already now can live a new life in God's service. And because he rose, sin and death have been conquered. And we live looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.